author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and we're here in Seattle, Washington with Andre Debuse, author of Dirty Love. Andre, welcome to Author. Thank you, Bill. Good to see you again, man. You know, I was thinking about, Andre, you, you said in the last time we talked, you, you mentioned how you write character-driven fiction. So how does a man who writes, a writer who writes character-driven fiction find the story? the plot, whatever that is. Well, let's look at those two words, story and plot. I love what Janet Burroway said. She said that story is a causal sequence of events with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Plot is how we arrange those events. So the key word for me, so we have to begin with story. I think too often, uh, and this is certainly the case if you're in a writing program or you're in a writing group or, and people are you know, looking at your work on a fairly regular basis, I think that oftentimes we plot too soon. We anticipate our audience prematurely when we should really give ourselves permission to find the story, to find that causal sequence of events. And the word, the key word for me, it seems, Bill, is causal. So what's causality? Well, it's causality, you know, bank robber puts a gun in your face and then you're in a gar car being chased by the cops. I mean, all that stuff's causal. But so is... In James Joyce's The Dead, the snow falling out the window that gets the woman to remember her uh, dead lover, which triggers her tears, which triggers her husband's questions, all of those sensual details are causal. So for me, the story is all about character because causation happens in characters. If I go deeply inside a character, and how do you go deeply? You know, I was just talking about this today. The only way to go inside a character is you first have to give a damn. In other words, sometimes you start writing about uh, a, a character and his or her situation, and you think you're curious about it, but you're not really. You're only half curious or a little curious. When you, you want to be writing about this or that, and if I've learned nothing over the years, I've learned that the writing is larger than the writer, and the same way you can't choose what, you know, who you fall in love with, you can't choose what you're curious about. So character-driven fiction for me, the reason it's, I call it character-driven, it's not my term, of course, is... They start to drive. The character starts to drive. How does that happen? By going into these characters with authentic curiosity, you find causation. Like the snow that brought the memory, that brought, brought the tears, that brought the exterior action. So for me, that's, that's just the engine of the whole baby. And frankly, that's the fun part. And you have to check in with that part of yourself that knows whether this is something that Andre could do something with. There is that yes or no within you to doc. Because a lot of things float through your head. A lot of images come to you. Well, see, yeah. that's the thing, right? So Stephen King, you know, was asked, we, we did a thing, and he, he, asked, he was asked, do you keep a story notebook? He said, no, for me, a story notebook is just a way to immortalize bullshit. <laughs> you know, because you'll get a thousand ideas for, you know, novels a year. You'll, right. you'll get one a day. Right. And, um, but they're just sexy ideas. You know, it's really kind of mysterious which ones have roots in the imagination. Yeah. See, I maintain this whole thing is mysterious, you know, and you know, one of the dangers of fine art instruction, it seems to me, is that it runs the risk of demystifying the writing process too much. The truth is, I think it's a mystery that human beings need stories, whether they're, you know, sitting around the fire, sitting on the stoop, or, you know, bastardized sitcoms. People crave stories for their interior lives, and it's also a mystery about where they come from. I mean, why would a I'm convinced that one story will knock on your imagination and won't knock on mine. Or I might want to write the one that, you know, people always come, it's interesting that it happens, you know, people come up to you and say, I've got a really good story idea for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, it's yes. like... And, and as soon it, as you say you're a writer, that happens to you. And, and look, I find it poignant <laughs> and moving, it, and I always do the same thing. I always shift it back to whoever's saying that to me. I say, well, it's a great story, you're right, but you know what? That's, that's your baby. Yeah. It's like someone say, hey, I just got pregnant. You want to you want to have it? <laughs> no, I think it should go back into your womb and you should have it. You know, this new book, Dirty Love, I think one of the things I was wrestling with in these novellas is, well, I look, I'm 54 and I've got this, this view now. I think I know why we're on the planet, Bill. You do? I think I've got the answer. Will you, will you share it with us? I sure will. Okay. I think the first thing, well, 
two things. I think ideally we're supposed to find out who we are and be that. We're supposed to live an authentic life. But the big thing I think we're supposed to do is to learn how to love and be loved. That's it. That's it. We're not here to be a success. We're not here to be a winner. We're not here to be famous. We're not here to be known. We're not here to be good sons and daughters even. We're here to learn how to, well, be nice if you would be good sons. <laughs> but we're here to learn how to love and be loved. And you know what? That's difficult because human life's a bit of a shitstorm. It can be. I agree 100%. And you need to practice it. You bet your ass. You know, I tell young guys who get married, I say, let me just tell you something, buddy. Let me tell you something <laughs> I've learned. Husband is not a noun. It's a verb. Yeah, amen. So is wife. So is partner, what, gay or straight, what have you. When you get married, you're not now, I think there's this subconscious belief, well, I'm a husband, I'm a wife, um, a partner, whatever. I'm as if husband is a state of being. No, it's a job description with a list of tasks. And if you want to be a good husband, you have to do them whether you want to or not. And by the way, it's not sacrificing yourself to the woman. It's actually sacking your, sacrificing yourself to the union with the woman, which is larger than both exactly. of you. And if you, do, if you remember that, you won't get so resentful and bitchy about it. Which is like your relationship with your reader. Your reader, you can't finish your book. Your reader finishes your book. That's what I came to learn is that oh, I like it's that. the reader who makes it big. You point them towards the truth, but that's the show don't tell. Right? I, I love what you just said. The reader finishes the book. Yeah. Bill Moyers, I don't know what the context was of this quote, but he said that he said the silence after Mozart is Mozart's yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. Somebody was asking me recently, um, you know, I like your new book, but boy, it makes me depressed. Do you ever think about how I'm going to feel? <laughs> I said, in fact, no. <laughs> and, I re and I'd never been asked that. And I realized, God, I don't think about how the reader's going to feel because it's none of my business. Yeah. I simply want I want to go so deeply into these characters with as, as much honesty as I can, whatever writing skills I've learned over the years, that I, as deeply as I can go, and then I, if I've gone deep enough into them, it will go into the reader, and then what it does there is so none of my business yeah. that I never think about whether this might be a sad ending or an uplifting ending or somewhere in between. And, um, but it's funny, I just just realize I, I never think about what the reader's going to feel. I'm always thinking about the reader in the way that Hemingway talked about when he said that writing is easy until you think of the reader. You can't just say, oh, John Fitzgerald was an odious man. No, you've got to paint odious. We've got to live through odiousness with John Fitzgerald. But, but after that, I don't think about the reader. When I teach writing, I say, you better love it like you'd love a marriage, because just like a marriage, you're going to get to the middle at some point in that marriage, and it's going to be rocky. It's going to be tough. But if you actually love the person, it's worth it. You better, in the middle of a book, it's going to get rocky at some point. Right. I love that analogy because we all know we love our spouses and our families. We don't always like them. <laughs> right? So no. That, sometimes we yeah. can't stand each other. That's right. Who the hell are you? But you still go through the actions of loving because you do actually love him or her. You don't like how they are now. Maybe you don't like yourself. And, and I think it's a really important skill because, you know, and I tell this to especially younger writers, you're going to fall out of love with this novel you're writing in about 10 days. It might be even less because you're going to find out how hard it is to pull this off, this image, that, this vision that you're beginning to get. And meanwhile, that sexy little number is going to be walking right by over <laughs> here, you know, your vampire cocaine <laughs> novel idea. Oh, I'm going to write the cocaine vampire novel so much sexier and you just can't stop looking at her ass but meanwhile you're married to this one and I'm convinced you have to commit to finishing this one because you're gonna fall out of love with that one in about 10 days too that's right and if people and, and I've known a lot of writers who will start and drop start and drop and they're like serial monogamous you know, look buddy you gotta if you don't see this project through if you don't commit to it you are literally never going to develop the muscle you need to finish a story or a novella or a novel, and then you never will. When I've written about writing, my language w begins to overlap with biblical language because I start talking about the moment I don't trust that the thing I think is interesting and funny and sexy and profound, the moment I doubt it's profound, I can no longer see it, I can no longer write it, I can no longer feel it. I have to trust without proof. And that's, that's, that's how faith gets defined. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing every single day. I think, to me, this is valuable. That's all I get. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then, but what's valuable, let's go look even deeper at that. I don't know if what I'm doing, I don't know if 
look, I don't know if, any, if anybody read this, if they would find value, but what I know is the daily practice is valuable. The practice itself is valuable, and I've learned over the years that the practice can actually lead to something made called a story, a novella, a novel that um, may have value. But even then, I, I never know. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm just fraught with doubt on that level. I, I don't even care if it's a huge bestseller. I don't believe it. I, mean, I don't believe it. I, I, I am always haunted by what I've written. You know how I feel? When I finish something, even if it's a nice hardcover book in stores, my feeling always is, sorry. <laughs> Why? I just feel that way. Sorry, I'll do better next time. Man. I don't know, but there's a, there's a great line from, uh, it's, a famous, it's a famous quote from Martha Graham that circles in theater fields. You may know it. Um, Martha Graham was a beautiful writer in addition to being a great choreographer and dancer. And, and she wrote, you know, she died in her 90s. And she wrote to Agnes DeMille, a fellow choreographer who was going through a bad time creatively. She said, no artist, Graham said, no artist is pleased. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time. Just a curious dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive. I, look, do I think it's an abject failure? No, because I wouldn't let it out in the world. But there's always that blessed unrest that I, you know, Picasso, I'm not comparing myself to freaking Picasso, but Picasso was asked, hey, Mr. Picasso, what's your favorite painting? So, oh, of, you know, of yours. He said, oh, that's easy, the next one. When I wrote simply to get something from the world of publishing and readers, like give me money, give me whatever, it was hollow. Give me attention. Give me attention, attention. But when I said, what can I give to people? That's when I, that's when I found something. What can I give to the well, world? Well, see, you're nailing it, man, because to me it seems that uh, the writing of fiction, creative nonfiction, what have you, is essentially an act of generosity yes. and humility. Yes. Where it's about giving, not taking. It's about seeing, not being seen. Um, I really have this belief, and I probably talk about it too much in, in writing classes, but I do believe that the... If you're writing honestly, nakedly, with authentic curiosity, uh, the writing becomes larger than the writer. Yeah. Because you discover truths you didn't know you were privy to. You know, a great line from Grace Paley, we write what we don't know we know. Yeah. And, and, and so that when you're going through the world, you know, I read a, an essay recently, and I forget, God, I forget who the writer was, but it was about writing memoir. And I had read it, because after telling you, I was reading more about memoirs. It's funny, I was reading about memoirs after I'd written one. <laughs> right. And um, so if you're going to write about your life, you must avoid the stench of the ego. Yep. And I love the phrase, the stench of the ego. But, you know, it's a good way to live anyway, yeah. whether you write or not. And, but I think especially if you want to enter in to these people, you'd better let go of judgment and the light on yourself. And, and in that sense, it's, it is. It's generous and humble. And I'm not saying writers are more generous or humble than anyone else, but the, the practice is.